Welcome to another episode of Mask or Peace Theater. I am your host, Professor James Pretentious. Join us this week as we look at a scandalous subject, politics. Should you vote? What is the Christian to do? Should we be involved in politics? Join Pastor Aaron Adams and Jamie Eklund as they talk about this today. You don't want to miss out. So a lot of uh, questions that we get asked, especially this time of year, mail-in ballots are coming out and stuff like that. Yeah. So uh, how, how should a Christian vote and how should they think about their mm. vote? Um, so here's my first question to you. Um, should Christians participate in politics? That's a hard question. Um, you know, I mean, m for most people, I think the only way that we participate is going to the polls yeah. and, and voting. Um, and I will confess myself, sometimes I get discouraged and I feel like, what's the point? Mm -hmm. um, but when I come back to it, I, I do think that Christians should participate. I think Christians need to be uh, as active in pushing back the darkness that we see in the world mm -hmm. everywhere we go. Yeah. And it doesn't take us very long to watch the news to see that politics is a very dark place. Yeah. Um, and we need to be fighting. We need mm -hmm. to be pushing back against that. And so, yeah, I do think we should be uh, involved in politics, and I think we should vote. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times um, it feels like you're kind of squeezed into um, a mold that you didn't pick, right? Yeah. So, And that's not unique to Christians. I think uh, Americans this year especially, and, yep. and a lot of times we look around and, and we just are kind of like, man, I don't want to be squeezed into one of these two camps, yeah. uh, but we kind of find ourselves there. And uh, as Christians especially, I think it's important for us to remember that we have an allegiance that comes before our citizenship in the United States, that Absolutely. we're citizens of um, the new heavens and the new earth. Mm -hmm. um, and there's going to be a day coming when our king is present uh, in the mm -hmm. flesh mm -hmm. and um, when Christ returns. And until that day, we have to live sort of almost with dual citizenship. Yeah. But if our um, kingdom citizenship doesn't come first, then um, we're missing out on the way that the Lord has designed us. Because like when, when I go to the ballot box to vote, um, I should be thinking, first of all, uh, what are the kingdom principles? Right. before the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God principles before mm -hmm. I say, uh, what does my political bar like party say? Yeah, absolutely. And sometimes I admit that's hard. Um, I grew up in Wyoming and I do have some very conservative leanings. Mm -hmm. I am very pro Second Amendment. Uh, but to be honest, it's hard for me to sit back and read the Bible and say that the Lord is passionate about our right to bear arms. Yeah. Um, it really is, mm -hmm. you know, and so I have to hold that in balance with everything else. Not mm -hmm. that it's unimportant, yeah. but it's not the most important. And we have to be able to weigh those things when we're voting for something. So that actually gets to a really good point, which is that we, we have a tendency to sort of get pet projects or pet like ideas, like the, the yeah. thing that really gets our, our, our dander up. And, yeah. and so for some people, that's the second amendment. Mm -hmm. And um, and it can become an idol, right? Yeah, that that you, you look at it and you say, instead of the worship of the Lord, uh, sometimes I'm tempted to worship uh, myself yep. and my right to do this or that. Mm -hmm. And uh, But that's not the only one. Yeah. And so um, I think that Christians have a unique opportunity um, in a world that is consumed with all kinds of idolatries to be able to say to our friends who share many of our convictions, yep. like, I can't go that far mm -hmm. because my Lord commands me to come in this direction with him. Yeah. So like um, another example of that would be uh, a place where we look and we say there's a genuine grievance that somebody has that uh, is legitimate and needs to be addressed, but the solution that's being offered goes against God's word as well. Mm -hmm. And so Christians often, because we feel squeezed into the two camps that the world wants us to find ourselves in, yeah. um, there's a great deal of pressure 
to do that when in actuality we should be offering a third way. We should be offering the kingdom way, the way that mm-hmm. says um, um, with God's word, um, I will um, commit to the welfare of the community I find myself in. That's what Jeremiah told the exiles to do. Pray for the welfare of the city you find yourself in. Really dig mm-hmm. into being a member of that community, but do so uniquely as the people of God. And so, um, you know, an example of this would be uh, in the current situation in the world with uh, um, uh, the tremendous um, political and social attention that's being given to issues of uh, injustices, uh, uh, racism, mm-hmm. and all of that. The Christian should, with a clear voice, say that we believe that racism is sinful that uh, to show partiality over one's uh, skin color or something else is sinful, that we're called to esteem everyone that has been made in the image of God Mm -hmm. according to the spirit and not according to the flesh. So like the flesh in me repeatedly wants to judge other people, wants to categorize, wants to do what the world does and to put everybody in little boxes. Mm -hmm. But the spirit calls me to welcome people into the community, to call people to faith in Jesus, regardless of their um, of of any characteristic yep. that would divide people according to the world. Yeah. Well, we want to, as a society, we want to bring division. We have division on age, on race, on sex, mm-hmm. on eth- ethnicity. Mm-hmm. We have all kinds of division on political orientation or sexual orientation. Mm-hmm. Um, But when you look at Jesus and when Jesus was on this earth, he treated everyone as equals, Mm -hmm. right? It doesn't matter their race. It didn't matter their gender. It didn't Mm -hmm. matter their age. Yeah. And, and we need to model that for the world. You know, this idea of caring for those who can't care for themselves Yeah. and to speak for those who can't speak for themselves, whether it's a race issue Mm -hmm. or whether it's. Uh, an abortion mm-hmm. issue. So when you say that, like that immediately gets us to another area where Christians often find themselves in a very difficult place socially, yeah. um, especially Christians who um, who have come to a very strong conviction uh, about the sanctity of, of human life mm-hmm. um, in the womb. And so what we end up with yet again is a, an issue that threatens to divide. Yeah. And, and I think that one of the things that we as Christians can do and have an opportunity to do is to reach across those lines with the love of Jesus so that we are able to answer questions that are that are put to us um, not with the uh, condemnation that the world throws around but with uh, with the love that the gospel provides so so like um, a good example of this um, is Jesus in John chapter 8 with the woman caught in adultery Mm -hmm. so this is a woman who the law gave uh, every right for um, the people to stone this woman for to death, death yeah. for her sin. And uh, so it wasn't the, that justice was not going to be served in her death. Mm-hmm. But sometimes what we find is that uh, earthly justice and, um, that's not tempered by mercy ends up being tyranny. Mm-hmm. And Jesus steps into that situation with uh, forgiveness offered to this woman, and he rescues her from the death that she actually deserves, yeah. which is kind of, I mean, that's just a small picture of what Jesus' entire mission was. Right. And so, so for Christians to be able to name a sin without condemning a person uh, for that sin and saying, you know, you, because of this, you're irredeemable mm-hmm. is absolutely critical in this day and age. So for yeah. instance, to be able to look at somebody and say, um, when, when you ended the life of your unborn child, You committed an evil act against that child, but Jesus loves you, Mm -hmm. and he loves you so much that he will provide forgiveness for any sin, including the sin of abortion or anything else, and he holds his hand out to you, his nail-scarred hand, to Mm -hmm. say, I have paid for every sin that you carry. And there's actually a lot of women, even women in our own uh, Christian communities, in our own churches, who carry the yeah. shame right. of, of feeling like they, they bear this mm-hmm. thing that they can never get rid of. Yeah. And the gospel offers grace mm. and peace and forgiveness and, um, and takes away the shame 
when the Lord Jesus reaches out the hand yeah. to pull you up and say, you are forgiven, mm -hmm. you are redeemed. Um, another topic on, on that, that is important in this respect is um, when we look and we say, like, um, as Christians, uh, we hold to a, a biblical understanding of human sexuality and mm -hmm. gender, um, that we believe God created man male and female. Like in, in Genesis chapter 1, uh, verse 27, it says that God created man uh, in the image of God. He created them. Male and female, he created them. That this, this um, common humanity that we share is a gift from God. But we also know that into the world, there's so much confusion. And uh, we stand in a place where we have an opportunity to speak um, words of comfort and grace and forgiveness and redemption and identity to those who have not been able to find their identity anywhere else. Yeah. And so they find themselves um, um, diving deep mm. into the brokenness that's in them. And instead of finding wholeness in their identity as a child of God by faith in Jesus Christ, they look for identity in their brokenness, yeah. in the brokenness of their, their uh, sexuality or the brokenness of their gender uh, dysphoria or identity or whatever else mm -hmm. you want to call it. And the gospel ought to be able to speak words of love and acceptance and kindness rather than, um, rather than falling into the world's trap of saying, yeah. agree with me or you will be rejected and hated. So I think you hit on the, the defining piece that we struggle with the most, and that is the identity. Mm -hmm. When we go back to what we were talking about before, when we look at the different political uh, parties that are out there, right? There's two predominant parties, and we feel like we're being pushed into one of those molds. Mm -hmm. Well, I got news for us. Like none of, the, none of the systems the world has created is a perfectly biblical mold. True. Other than the Bible, <laughs> other than Christianity, yeah, right, true, pure mm -hmm. Christianity, biblical Christianity, biblical yeah. Christianity, and so when we look at all these things, where whether it's your sexual orientation, whether it's your sin, whether it's your political party, or mm -hmm. whether you know how are you going to vote, what hill are you going to die on, we always want to find like where is our identity. Yeah. And so often, that's why I think the world is so confused, is we don't know where our identity is. Yeah, absolutely. And this is where the gospel um, brings clarity. If you, if you look in Romans chapter 8, um, it starts out with this uh, statement, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free mm. in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the law, or according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. And then later in this text, we find out, it says in verse 9, you, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. And then later on in the text, um, we're referred to as uh, sons and daughters of God, adopted into his right. family. So uh, what we find here in maybe the greatest chapter in uh, the greatest a book of all of Paul's letters, yeah. uh, we find our identity described mm. as being in Christ yeah. by faith, adopted into the family of God, united with God yeah. by the work of Jesus Christ. And if we find our identity there, then um, all of a sudden there's a great deal more clarity when it comes to all of these things that are trying to get our attention. Right. I don't have to consider myself a member of this group or that political party yeah. because I belong to Jesus. Right. I may identify in some way with those things, but if my identity in that political party or that group or, or that movement or whatever else it is comes before my, or, or that 
identity in uh, terms of, like you, you mentioned, sexuality and, and, and gender, but even like ethnicity or culture or anything else, if those things come before my identity in Christ, then I'm going to miss out yeah. on the fullness of peace mm. that God has to offer in Christ. And, and uh, as a result, many Christians walk around in fear right. and um, um, confusion. Mm -hmm. because they've forgotten that their identity is supposed to be in Christ. Yeah. And this idea of adoption, mm -hmm. obviously, is something I'm very passionate about. Yeah, It's something that our family wanted to live out in a very practical way with our daughter Zoe. And when I think of our daughter Zoe, she is as much my daughter mm -hmm. and receives all the blessing and all the kindness and all my love as much as any of my biological children. Mm -hmm. And when we remember that, Mm -hmm. And we remember that it's through the blood of Christ mm -hmm. that we become children of God. And because we are children of God, we receive all the blessing and favor and, and peace that mm -hmm. God gave Jesus. Mm -hmm. He also gives us. Amen. And because of that, mm -hmm. we are united in his, in his family. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Oh, oh. Anything we say cannot be held against us because we are no longer, or we are no attorneys or yeah. accountants yeah, or politicians for that matter. That's true. <laughs> so uh, I heard that they're going to mail out our mail-in ballots this week. So uh, Jamie, one of the things, one of the questions that I get asked a lot is, uh, what do you think about mail-in voting? <laughs> <laughs>